Hello, everyone. Welcome to End Well Live, where each week we're having a conversation with a very special guest about how in this unprecedented time of crisis, we can all collectively find community and best support those facing serious illness, support caregivers and families. I'm Shoshana Ungerleiter, a physician and the founder of Endwell, where we focus on generating human-centered interdisciplinary innovation for the end of life experience to make the end of life a part of life. And I hope you are all safe and healthy. And if not healthy, I hope that you're on the mend. We are all where we're wearing our dress shirts on the top and our on our sweatpants on the bottom. <laughs> and, and we're coming to you today to find community in each other and support uh, both our physical and our emotional health through this virtual conversation. And today I'm, I'm really excited. I have the pleasure of speaking with my friend, Dr. Sunita Puri, who's a palliative care physician at USC and the author of That Good Night, Life and Medicine in the 11th Hour. It's an incredible book. You can see it. It's, it's up here on my <laughs> bookshelf. Um, I highly recommend it. If you haven't already read it, it's just beautiful. Uh, we're going to talk for about 15 minutes and then open it up to you. So please enter at any point your questions, your thoughts down below in the comment section. And then we encourage you to share this conversation um, clicking the share button on your own page so that other people can can join in and uh, and talk with us. And I want to give a special thank you to the Cambia Health Foundation and the Tauber Family Foundation for their support of this program. So with that, welcome Sunita. How are you? How are you doing with all of this? Thank you so much for having me, Shoshana, and hello to everybody who's joining. I think it's really wonderful to have this space, even though it's over a screen, to come together and congregate and talk about some very important issues. Um, so I'm doing okay. I'm trying to stay centered and calm in the midst of the storm that I think all of us are facing, both at work and the hospital, and also just kind of wrestling with what being in solitude has come to mean for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, are, are dealing with that. Um, I know I am. I feel like the days and time uh, is kind of speeding up. Um, in yeah. an odd sense, I feel a little disoriented in terms of, of what, what day it is, what time it is, where I'm, where I'm, what I'm supposed to be eating, what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, so before we dive in, I, I'd love to have you first tell us a bit about what a palliative care physician does and, and who you yes. work with. Certainly. So um, in palliative care, we're very lucky to work on teams. And palliative care itself is a medical subspecialty that really focuses on caring for patients and their families when they're facing a serious illness. That serious illness could be uh, advanced cancer that's just been diagnosed. It could be getting into the ICU after a serious accident. And what we really specialize in in palliative medicine is treating physical pain, but also emotional and spiritual pain that come with that experience of being sick, feeling uncomfortable, and wrestling with what it means to be sick and how it's changed your life. And we do that in teams because it can simply not fall to one doctor to treat all of those aspects of suffering. So we have nurses, we have spiritual care providers and social workers to help us in this mission. And it's really focused on helping people to have the best quality of life possible when they're facing something physically and emotionally disabling. Yeah. And, and I think what I love about palliative care, most people out there know that I'm like a huge advocate for, for the field. And that's that the earlier people get referred to palliative care, the, the data suggests that they, that they live longer and, and, they're, and they feel better, um, yes. which, which I think it's, it's important also uh, to point out for sure. Definitely. I think a lot of people have a misconception that you either get palliative care or you get other medical care. 
And the beautiful thing about palliative care is you can get it right alongside your other medical care. So let's say you've just gotten diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and you have a lot of pain and you're getting chemo. You can continue to see your cancer doctor and get chemo and other forms of treatment. And you can also get treatment from the palliative care team that will attend to controlling your pain, controlling your nausea, talking to you about how you're doing through this experience and helping you to define what's most important to you in your life so we can match your medical care plan to privilege the things that matter most to you. So it's not a choice between getting palliative care and getting other medical care. The beautiful thing is they can go together and then they lead precisely to the outcome you mentioned, Shoshana, which is people live better. And some, study, some studies show people live longer with palliative care. Yeah. Well, I, I'd imagine you're quite busy right now at, at USC caring for patients. Can you tell us what it's been like and what you've been doing personally to cope? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely been an experience fraught with a lot of anxiety, I think, from patients and families, but also my colleagues. We've been kind of trying to prepare for this surge that's supposed to hit, I think, today. And in the midst of all of that preparation, we've also been tending to some very sick patients, about half or a third of whom are in our ICUs with COVID and the rest who are not. And our palliative care team actually follows and cares for every patient who goes to the ICU who's been diagnosed with COVID. And that means that we are working really closely with the ICU team to help patients and families define what they want for themselves and what level of kind of technologic intervention in the ICU would really be most beneficial to them when they're very sick. What I've found, and I think what adds an extra layer of anxiety these days, is that many, many patients and families have not had the discussions about what matters most to them and what level of medicine, medical intervention they'd want for themselves. So they may come in, for example, with severe COPD and severe heart disease and have had, for example, multiple interventions in their heart, but they may never have had a discussion about their illness and what sort of life they would wanna live if they got really sick. So they come in really sick having had all of these other experiences with health crises, but not having had that discussion. So a big part of our role is to help people think through those questions um, and to help our physicians actually make recommendations about whether ICU level care will really be helpful for some of the sickest patients we see. And if it would be helpful, how do we help them know whether it's truly benefiting them, whether they're truly recovering throughout the course of their ICU stay. So by getting involved in the beginning, we can kind of be that constant voice throughout an ICU stay to make sure people are getting the right information and asking and answering the right questions. But I think a lot of the anxiety has been around people not having considered these questions and then us asking them these questions when they're already worried about things like rationing or how sick they can get with COVID. So it's been a really anxious time. Oh, I can't imagine. Oh my goodness. Um, so yesterday was National Healthcare Decisions Day, yes. where we hope uh, to inspire the public and educate and empower folks and providers about the importance of exactly what you're talking about, advanced yeah. care planning. Um, so, you know, why, uh, and, and you've sort of touched on this for sure, but why, especially now with COVID, does advanced care planning matter for everybody? Um, not just, of course, the people who have underlying chronic illness, but, but families um, for clinicians as well who are yep. being exposed to the virus. Um, and you know, is this a conversation that we should really be having throughout life? Mm -hmm. So I think now what we're seeing with COVID is that people of any age and any state of health can be affected. So you can get young people who might be in their 20s or 30s who have never really had a health issue and all of a sudden they get very, very sick from COVID and they haven't considered what they might want for themselves if living longer meant living with the support of life support machines, for example. And then we see people who are on the front lines, as you mentioned, providing care who may not have considered their own wishes because I think as doctors, sometimes we think we're immune to what we're seeing. 
I've certainly thought that, that I treat cancer. I don't get cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain level of being on the front lines that numbs you to the reality that that could one day be your reality. And the truth is that COVID, like any form of illness that takes our life, spare, spares nobody. And I think it's, you know, even pre-COVID, people in their 20s and 30s could get into accidents, right? Mm -hmm. People could have really unexpected things happen to them. So knowing that amidst life, death is with us, mm -hmm. that is something that I've kind of held close throughout my life and knowing that every day, any moment could be my last. And I think trying to embody that attitude towards death has made me do my advanced directive a long time ago, but I think it's important for all of us to kind of use COVID as an example that mortality is all around us. So what can we do to write down our wishes and make sure that our bodies and our dignity is protected and that the treatment we get is really what we would want for ourselves when we get sick? And I want to expound upon that just a little bit because it's a little vague. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes, you know, we could, if you got a very serious cancer, for example, some treatments might prolong life at the cost of its quality. And so thinking about what quality of life matters to you, what are the activities you would not want to live without doing? What are the things that give you joy in the day to day? Who gives you joy? Who would you want to be around? Answering those questions can help you answer things like, would you want to be on life support for a prolonged period of time or not? Because you would go back to thinking, would a prolonged period of life support give me the goal of being able to go back to work or whatever it is that's important to you? So really breaking that down is so important as, a, as part of living your life and preparing for the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for, for going deeper into what those questions that we all should be pondering are. And I think also important yeah. to point out, we need to be revisiting these throughout life, yes. right? Because what it looks like for me at 39 uh, is not mm -hmm. maybe what it's going to be like at 55 or 75 totally. or 95, right? And so yep. um, this is a uh, continuous process. Um, so you've written about the fact that you came to your specialty because of your interest in the tension between medicine's impulse, as you say, to preserve life at all costs, wow. and a spiritual embrace of, of life's uh, temporality. Um, uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe how you bring your own spirituality into your work as a physician, if at all? Certainly. So I was very, very lucky to be raised by parents who were both scientists, but who are also very God-fearing. And some of, some of my earliest memories of my dad telling me stories were from the Bhagavad Gita, which is a really, really beautiful poem in the Hindu tradition. And so much of what the Gita talks about is that life is temporary and that there's a beautiful line from it that goes as, as follows. The, the soul wears the body like a cloth and discards it at the time of death. And Growing up being exposed to those sorts of lines and other couplets by Indian poets like Kabir, who really reflect on death as being an extension of life, as being the natural end to life, it was very much normalized for me. Now, that doesn't mean that thinking about death doesn't make me sad, right? But it means that I've been a certain sort of acceptance of it and surrender to it has been a part of my life because I've heard these lessons over and over again. And when I've seen and taken care of patients, especially early in my medical training, embracing a natural end was like the opposite of what I was being trained to do, which was to defy the end, to use medicine and machines and my knowledge to try to fight off nature. And sometimes that works really beautifully, right? We have vaccines for that reason. We have safer childbirth for that reason. Surgeries go better for that reason. And yet when somebody is really, really sick at the very end of their life, what I lost track of was whether knowing if somebody's sickness was something reversible or whether somebody's sickness was kind of the final blow in the series of blows their body had taken in the process of dying. And so I think part of what helps me reconcile the sadness I feel with death and some of the 
the challenges I have clinically with knowing how to treat people when they're really sick is reminding myself that science and spirituality can really sit together, that I can be a doctor and fight for life, but also remember that quality of life has a huge place in my treatment plan. And that just because I can do something for someone, meaning take them to the ICU and intubate them, for example, that doesn't mean I should do it if they need to be on a ventilator because their lungs are experiencing their final shutdown. So I think having an embrace of mortality helps me to feel a little more at peace with what it means to acknowledge the natural process of dying in my patients. And I still have sadness for that. It doesn't mean it doesn't affect me as a human being, but it means that I can feel the sadness and have a little bubble of peace around it. That's beautiful. I wanna remind everybody, please and enter your questions and comments uh, below, and please do share this conversation on your own page so we can continue talking to, uh, to more people in this community. And speaking of quality of life, Sunita, what are you doing? Uh, physicians are human beings. And so um, what, what are you doing to take care of yourself right now um, in, in the face of, of all the suffering? Yeah, so I want to be very honest that taking care of myself has always been a challenge. And I think that may be true for a lot of people listening to this. My guess is that a lot of us are caregivers and caretakers. And sometimes I, I've always thought that taking care of myself and feeling fulfilled meant taking care of other people and finding fulfillment in that. And I have been on this journey over the past about year to separate doing for others and separate that from kind of doing for myself and not thinking that that was selfish. So mm -hmm. to answer totally honestly, I don't know that I have the best self-care routine down pat, but some of the things I'm trying to do more of are really stay connected with people I love. Um, I spend a lot more time with my dog than I have been in the previous months when I've been kind of running around like a chicken with my head cut off. I've been trying to do a lot more meditation and to just take slow walks outside rather than fast jogs or, you know, intense workouts that I've put myself through in the past. It's been a period of kind of trying to slow down and in the slowing down, really kind of learning how to enjoy my own presence. Because I think for a long time, I wasn't comfortable with just being by myself. And this is the time where I'm really learning to do that. And I think learning to be comfortable with your own presence is a part of self-care. Yeah. And I know you've been doing some amazing baking too. Oh, you've, you've, sent, yeah. you've sent me your photos of, of cookies and cupcakes and my mouth is, oh, is watering yes. when I see them. So I have, I think there's this, um, other pandemic going on of people at home just baking a ton. I think I actually read some article about it. And so I've joined those masses. Just one day I was like, you know what? I want to do something that will make my house smell really good. And I want to just bake some batter. So I baked this big thing of chocolate chip cookies and I took it to my team and to the ICU teams and certainly had some myself. Then I made cupcakes that were like a it was the recipe from Magnolia Bakery, oh, which the best, <laughs> like so good. And then I made some banana nut muffins with cinnamon that I just oh gave gosh. out yesterday. But the next one is the recipe I sent you, the sour cream coffee cake. Yep. And that's well, maybe, maybe we'll do that next week. <laughs> that's what we should do. Yes, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Is, is, there, is there some learning that you hope that individuals or maybe our culture or maybe the healthcare system takes yeah. going forward from this time? What can we learn from this incredible uh, crisis that we clearly have not been prepared for? But, but how, yeah. how can we learn from it? I think something that it's really brought to the forefront is to appreciate all of the things that we used to be able to do with ease that are no longer possible to do with ease. So just, you know, going over to a friend's house, going over to have, going out to have dinner with someone, those tiny little things, I have a lot more appreciation for, and I think hopefully everybody else will too. But I think something really big that we need to take from this is that anytime there's this sort of crisis, 
the inequalities in society really come through nice and bright. And so thinking about moving forward, how this pandemic has disproportionately affected African Americans, other communities of color, other vulnerable populations because of the essential inequalities they already face in getting access and to healthcare and access to good quality health care. That's something I really hope we as a society will reflect on moving forward. And even thinking about what we pay workers in restaurants, for example, food delivery companies, janitorial staff, all the people that are kind of putting themselves on the line to help some parts of our society continue to keep going, but putting their own lives at risk and their economic situation is devastating. So I think this pandemic has really given me a lot to reflect on about things I didn't necessarily dedicate myself to learning more about. And I think to create a more equitable, loving, close society, looking at those cracks and thinking, how can we seal them with humanity and compassion moving forward? I think that's something I really hope we come out of this with. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're going to open it up now to your questions. If thoughts, other questions come up, please enter them in the comments below. Our first question for Sunita is from Leslie. And Leslie asks, is there a discussion about people with chronic conditions that may get mm -hmm. the virus and are fearful of going to the hospital and then dying there yeah. alone without family? Is that something that you've heard about? Definitely. So for a lot of patients with chronic health conditions, especially those that we know make them more vulnerable to getting the virus, we really encourage people to try to stay at home as much as possible and to follow all of the safety precautions that are being given out by the government. Um, and I think using telemedicine for those patients mm -hmm. is especially important so they don't have to go in to see their doctor or go into a place where they may be, may be more exposed. And I think if people with those conditions do get sick, trying to let their doctors know early on before things spiral out of control and you may need to go to the hospital, that is my strong suggestion. Your symptoms may not be from COVID, but the earlier your doctor is involved, the earlier we can get you treated and determine if it is COVID, how do we address it immediately? Yep, that's great. Um, and we have another question from Michael. Michael asks, how important is the role of a social worker in a palliative mm -hmm. care team? I think the social worker, I mean, especially the social worker I get to work with is hugely helpful. I think the training of social workers is really unique in that they have exposure to psychodynamics, for example, to therapy, to recognizing how a family system works. And how a family system works is really critical to, have, to helping us navigate family meetings. I also think the psychosocial support that social workers are uniquely positioned to provide outside of a formal family meeting is hugely helpful. And I think they can sometimes be an advocate for patients and their families when the medical team may not be in the best position to do so. And they can help empower families to ask some of the right questions during meetings and not during meetings. So I think the role of the social worker is huge in our, in our teams. Yeah, agreed. And in, in my uh, encounters and interactions with social workers and with patients and families, it's just been phenomenal. And I always learn a lot from yeah. how social workers engage, engage with patients and families. Um, Grace asks, um, how should one approach their parents or other family members to talk about these subjects? I assume yeah. she means um, advanced care planning, even if they're not currently in a serious condition themselves. Yep. So that's something I wrote about in my piece that ran recently in the New York Times and something that I write about a lot in my book. I have a whole chapter where I talk about the impetus for me to talk to my parents and how difficult that was. And the setting then had been that I had taken care of an Indian woman who'd had a massive stroke. And seeing that really made me realize that my parents are not immortal, right? And yet how I broached the subject with them as a daughter rather than a doctor felt overwhelming. So my suggestion would be to approach your parents from a place of love and concern rather than anxiety and fear that you, may one, that you will one day lose them. And I think framing it like mom and dad, I wanna to talk to you about something that's been on my mind and that's really important to me because I care about you. And I wanna make sure that when you get sick, I know what you would want for yourself if you were so sick that, for example, you needed to go to the ICU. 
I'm asking right now because of COVID, but I'm also realizing that because of COVID, anything can happen at any time. I want to be prepared to be your advocate rather than coming at it with a lot of fear. We have fear, but to acknowledge and let it acknowledge it and let it go and focus on the coming from the place of love and compassion can diffuse the situation for everyone, I think. Yeah. Luke asks, how do we engage youth or Generation Z in the advanced care planning discussion? Uh, he asks if either of us have creative engagement strategies on this. It's something that I know at Endwell, we're constantly thinking about yes. what are the creative ways that we can get really everybody, of course, young people, um, too, involved in this conversation that is uh, a little scary, um, especially now with, with everything going on with COVID and, you know, how can we incentivize people or encourage this conversation mm -hmm. um, to be seen as something that's important throughout life? Uh, I would say that uh, it's very tricky. Uh, as somebody who's looked into a lot of solutions, it's, there, there isn't a clear and obvious one. Um, but that, you know, at points in time, like potentially when we get married or, or have some, you know, partnering um, ceremony or have our first child, um, those are natural points in time for young people to be thinking and reflecting on their own lives and, and saying to themselves, if something ooh, happens to me, you yeah. know, what, who would be caring for this child and, and what, exactly. what might I want to be thinking about there. I don't know if you have other thoughts about like creative or innovative solutions for younger people. Yeah. I think that one thing that could be helpful, especially right now, is pe young people who have had COVID, who are willing to speak out about that experience, having them really use social media, videos, other things like that to get their message out. I think that would be really important. And I know there was a piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago by a woman in her 20s in New York who got COVID, was hospitalized, may have been in the ICU, I don't quite remember, but I remember reading that and thinking this should be sent out through schools and colleges, for example, to get people to start thinking about this. Mm -hmm. The other thought I had is that when young people are experiencing the loss of, for example, an aunt and uncle, a grandparent, those are good times for them to start reflecting on what sort of death they would want, on what their relationship to death is, on what brings their life meaning. Um, those big questions, I think, just as you mentioned, Shoshana, at transition points, either their own or the transition points of those they love, I think those are really good ways to get people thinking and a campaign to attract young people to those questions might be done through a youth organization, or something like that um, to try to get the message out and try to get the questions out. Yeah, yeah. Our, our last question is from Stephanie and how have you and your team gotten creative with helping um, families to communicate and, and see each other during the yeah. crisis? I know you mentioned you guys are using a lot of telemedicine through iPads and stuff. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did um, recently was start to suggest that families record audio notes to their loved ones, things they want to say, things that they miss about their loved one, anything like that. And we would actually have the nurse take the audio note into the patient room and play it for them, especially mm -hmm. if the patient doesn't have an iPhone or another device, or if the patient is intubated and can't talk back to their family. That was actually really, really helpful and helped that family to feel like they were still speaking to their loved one. When patients are still in the ICU or elsewhere and they're awake, when we do family meetings, one thing an ICU colleague of mine did during the meeting, which I thought was fabulous, was he took his iPad into the patient's room and during the meeting had the family be able to actually see their loved one, mm -hmm. whether or not the loved one was intubated. And if they weren't, then the loved one could actually speak back to the family during the meeting. And I think those uses of technology are really invaluable during this time. We also Definitely. will, I'll often ask people whose loved ones are intubated, what sort of music do they love? Is there something that they would find really soothing to be playing in the background? And I've gotten everything from Madonna to Bon Jovi <laughs> to Naughty by Nature. This is over the years, not just now, to religious hymns. So you'd be surprised. Brick House has come up a couple times. So 
even that, asking people, what sort of music does this person like? What would they find soothing? It not only helps the patient, but it helps you get a little bit of insight into who the person is, especially if they're intubated and they can't talk to you. So those are a few of the things we've done. Yeah, thank you. And now in, in closing, uh, Sunita, I know there was uh, something that you wanted to read, a uh, piece of, of wisdom that you, that you wanted yeah. to share with us. Certainly. So, you know, I think something we didn't talk directly about in this um, conversation, but something I think is on a lot of people's mind is on the con is the concept of grief mm -hmm. and the kind of incremental losses that we've all been facing. And I found myself kind of returning to this really beautiful passage in Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking. And I wanted to read a little bit about what she has to say about grief. And I think for me, at least, it really resonated with what many people, including myself, have experienced during this time. Grief turns out to be a place none of us know until we reach it. We anticipate that someone close to us could die, but we do not look beyond the few days or weeks that immediately follow such an imagined death. We misconstrue the nature of even those few days or weeks. We might expect, if the death is sudden, to feel shock. We do not expect this shock to be obliterative, dislocating to both body and mind. We might expect that we will be prostrate, inconsolable, crazy with loss. We do not expect to be literally crazy, cool customers who believe that their husband is about to return and need his shoes. In the version of grief we imagine, the model will be healing. A certain forward moment will prevail. The worst days will be the earliest days. We imagine that the moment to most severely test us will be the funeral, after which this hypothetical healing will take place. When we anticipate the funeral, we wonder about failing to get through it, rise to the occasion, exhibit the strength that invariably gets mentioned as the correct response to death and loss. We anticipate needing to steal ourselves for the moment. Will I be able to greet people? Will I be able to leave the scene? Will I be able to even get dressed that day? We have no way of knowing that this will not be the issue. We have no way of knowing that the funeral itself will be anodyne, a kind of narcotic regression in which we are wrapped in the care of others and the gravity and meaning of the occasion. Nor can we know ahead of the fact and here lies the heart of the difference between grief as we imagine it and grief as it is. The unending absence that follows, the void, the very opposite of meaning, the relentless succession of moments during which we will confront the experience of meaninglessness, meaninglessness itself. Mm. Such a hard passage, so full of some level of darkness, but also kind of really explaining that the grief that we feel, we may not fully understand it. We may not fully understand it for years to come, but that that is also okay. And I go to that passage, not only because it's beautiful and to some extent because it's dark, but because I think she's right. So I hope that all of you get a chance to check that book out. And I hope that you continue to be safe and healthy and well during these days. Thank you. So I, I just want to close by saying, uh, you know, thank you to Sunita. We want you to tune in next week uh, for the host of the Sick Boy podcast, Jeremy Saunders, whose personal experience living with cystic fibrosis um, has given him a, a deep perspective on living with illness, on self-isolation, on, on strategies for self-care. He's super funny. Um, so please tune in next week. I want to give a special thank you again to our sponsors, Cambia Health Foundation and the Tauber Family Foundation. And again, thank you to Sunita. It's been wonderful seeing your face here to all of you for, for tuning you. in. Um, to everybody, stay safe and well out there.